Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a great day to be alive. You know, the Bible says that this is the day the Lord has made, and therefore, we have every cause to rejoice and be glad in it. I trust you're doing well. I trust your family is doing well. Um, I trust you're keeping healthy during this time. We're going to get straight into the Word. Over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be um, sharing a topic uh, which is very close to my heart, uh, and I believe the Lord will have me share at this time. But before we get into the Word, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful because it's in you that we live, it's in you that we move, it's in you that we have our being. We are secure in your presence. Holy God, as we, um, as we embrace uh, this season, uh, this season of newness in you, we ask, oh God, that through your Spirit, um, open our eyes today. Let us see new things, wondrous things out of your Word. Our desires to be transformed through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let that be our experience today, wherever we are, in every home, in every family, whether we're in close proximity or we're in other shores. Lord, let your revelation light shine into our hearts. We're so thankful for the communion of the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as um, the lockdown is being lifted and the world braces itself for a new normal, um, the acronym VUCA has taken on a new meaning. Uh, the term VUCA was used since 1987 as economic experts, as world leaders and army generals grappled with the increasing volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity of living in an increasingly globalized world. They came up with the term VUCA um, to describe the, just the environment in which the world was operating in. Now another word has been added uh, to that VUCA equation uh, that even makes it more potent, and that's the word pandemic. So the new normal that the world is preparing for is that of restrictions, uh, of uncertainty, uh, of fear for livelihood and the future. Companies are, uh, are, are downsizing. Businesses are making plans for contraction. People are beginning to hoard things. You know, God said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.11, he said, Jeremiah, what do you see? And Jeremiah responded, he said, God, I see the branch of an almond tree. And God said, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. So in other words, it is possible to see and yet not see well. It is possible to see and yet not see well. That is why when God spoke to Jeremiah and inquired about what he saw and how he interpreted it, God could sanction his sight as accurate sight. Because, brothers and sisters, if what you are seeing in this time is causing you fear, it is a clear sign that you may be seeing, but you are not seeing well. Uh, and the reason I can say that is because we know from Scripture that in 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Um, so any action that proceeds out of fear, no matter how legitimate and valid it may look from the outside, will never lead you into God's highest and best for you because the path of fear and the, the product of fear will never experience the high life. You know, the way translation of Romans 1.17 states that it is from the soil of faith that the righteous will grow up into real life. So what are you seeing what is the emotion that is stirred up in your heart from your sight? If it is fear, it means that we're not seeing well. If we're taking actions, if we're starting new enterprises based on fear, it, it means that the fruit of what we're going to produce in that dimension cannot lead us into the high life because it is from the soil of faith that the righteous grow up, grows up into real life. But when we talk about fear, you know, it's important to understand that you cannot dispel fear by saying, fear, get thee behind me. 
You know, fear leaves when we see well. Fear flees whenever there is sightedness that comes from a heart of truth. You know, last, last year, uh, towards the end of the year, as we began to pray uh, about 2020, the Lord began to speak to me, and one of the things he said very clearly was that 2020 will be a year of advancement through accurate sight. Advancement through accurate sight. That word has burned so deeply in my heart that I shared with the church and said, you know, that is our theme for 2020, advancement through accurate sight. Now, note the word advancement. Advancement speaks about progress. It speaks about elevation. But an elevation and progress that comes from seeing well. That comes from seeing well. Now, that was a, what we call a spirit rema, a word that has come from the spirit. But, you know, even the logos, the written word, confirms um, the understanding that you and I in Christ go from strength to strength and from glory to glory. You know, Isaiah, speaking about the Christ and his kingdom, through prophetic revelation documented in Isaiah 9, verse 6, he began to speak about the Lord that was coming. And he said, he said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then he said, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Of the increase of his government, of the increase of his kingdom, of his government and peace, there will be no end. You know, this is the same kingdom, the same government that Paul was speaking about in Colossians 1, 13. When he says, you and I have been delivered from the power of darkness and we have been conveyed and planted into the kingdom of his dear son. So we're under the government of God. Uh, in fact, Hebrews 12, 23, um, which I will read later, also speaks about the fact that we are now citizens of heaven. And our registration as citizens is recorded in heaven. When you gave your life to Christ, your name was written in the book of life. You were recognized as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Philippians 3.20 says our citizenship is in heaven. So when we speak about the government of the king, it applies to us. And Isaiah by the Spirit said the increase. Of the increase of this government and peace, there will be no end. Now, the government of God speaks about the rule of God in the lives of men. So he's saying that the rule of God in the lives of men is on the increase year after year. As a citizen of this kingdom, you have the opportunity to experience a greater dimension of everything that is in the kingdom year after year. Um, in this kingdom, we don't withdraw. In this kingdom, we don't draw back. In this kingdom, we move forward every year. Every year, we go from strength to strength and glory to glory. In this kingdom, there's an increase of our experience of God's government. What does that include? Increase of our intimacy with the Lord. Increase of the experience of the provision of God. Increase of everything in the kingdom. The health that Jesus uh, purchased for us at the cross. The wisdom of God that has been made available to us in Christ. The fruit of the Spirit. There's an increase in the earth today. The kingdom is expanding. There's an increase in salvations, an increase in healings. An increase in the impact of the kingdom in the lives of men. And it says those who walk in, under this reign can walk in greater peace year upon year. Hallelujah. There's an increase of his government. There's an increase of his peace. And that increase will never end. That increase will never end. That is accurate sight. That is based on truth. 
That is the sightedness that is required to dispel fear. But, but beyond just reading a scripture, how do we build this type of sight? How do we see well um, as we get up in the morning, as we go about our business, as we interact with the affairs of this life? How do we in seeing always see well? I believe that we must expand our field of vision beyond what we are seeing around us and what the media is communicating. We must expand our field of vision to embrace what I call the full picture, the full picture. We must train our eyes to see well. We must train our eyes to see well. You know, we actually don't see with our eyes, we see with our hearts. Your field of vision is actually determined by your heart, not your eyes. Now, wh wh why do I say this? Well, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. I'm going to be reading the Message Bible translation um, because Paul was giving the Corinthians some insight into how to begin to expand their field of vision. He said, dear, dear Corinthians, I, can, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide, open, spacious life. In other words, Paul was saying that there is a wide, open, spatial, spacious life that is available to you and I. And in the case of the Corinthians, it was available to them as well, but they were not experiencing it. So there's a wide, open, spacious life available to you wherever you are in your experience with God right now. If you're a member of this kingdom, there is a wide, open, spacious life that is available to you right now. Let's continue the passage. He said, we didn't fence you in. We didn't fence you in. So this means that the Corinthians were experiencing some kind of restriction in their lives, in their expression of life. Uh, and restriction is not something that we are unfamiliar with. You know, even before the pandemic and before the lockdown, restrictions in terms of financial restriction. I, I can't do that because I don't have enough money. Uh, I am not like others that have the opportunity. I don't have the opportunity. Uh, they've taken my job. I'm trying the best I can. I can't seem to get a new one or a better one. Restriction in health. Restriction in wisdom. He says, we didn't fence you in. Paul says, yes, you are experiencing real restriction. But, but let us uh, examine this. And, and, and see the true picture. Let's continue. He says, the smallness you feel, the smallness you feel comes from within you. That restriction that you are experiencing in your life is actually uh, not just external, it began in your heart first. He said, the smallness you are feeling, the smallness you are experiencing comes from within you. Your lives are not small, but you are living them in a small way. He said, I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open your lives. Live openly and expansively. In other words, he's saying there's a bigger world you can't see because of the restriction in your heart. There's a bigger world you can't see because of the restriction in your heart. You see, to see well, we must expand our field of vision to embrace the full picture. We must remove the blinkers that we have allowed the world to set in our hearts. I'll say that again. We must remove the blinkers that the world, we have allowed the world to set in our hearts. We must remove the blinkers that we have allowed the world to set in our hearts. You know, in his letter to the Romans, um, in Romans chapter 12, I'm going to read from um, the Phillips translation. 
Paul made this statement. He said, with eyes open wide. He says, with eyes wide open to the mercies of God. Let, let me just stop there. He says, with eyes wide open to the mercies of God. So in other words, he, he began by saying that if you are not seeing the mercies of God where you are right now, it means that you are not seeing well. Your eyes are not wide open. So he says, with eyes wide open, with eyes wide open, expand your field of vision. With eyes wide open. You know, even in Jeremiah's time, when Jeremiah was going through and the people of Israel were going through great anguish and lamentations, and Jeremiah, you know, was inspired to write the book of Lamentations. Even in the book of Lamentations, he had to make this concession in Lamentations 3.23. He said, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So even in the midst of calamity, because his eyes were open wide, he could see well. And in the midst of turmoil, he could still see the increasing mercy of God. Let's continue the passage. Romans chapter 12. He says, with eyes wide open, to the mercies of God. I beg you, my brothers, as an act of intelligent worship, to give to him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated and acceptable by him. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. Don't let the world around you, don't allow the world around you to squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within. So that you may prove in practice, oh, come and repeat with me, in practice, that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and moves toward the goal of true maturity. When our eyes are open wide, um, when we resist the squeezing of the world, we, in practice, we will demonstrate the plan of God in our lives. It's a good plan. It's a great plan. Paul says, resist that active action of the world system. Resist that active. You see, the world system is not passive. The action of the world system is active, and you have to actively resist it. Resist the active action of the world system to restrict your life by squeezing your heart into its way of seeing things. That's what the world system does. It squeezes our hearts. Because if it's going to restrict your life, it's going to begin by restricting your heart. If it's going to restrict your sight, the, the restriction has to come in your heart. So the world system, which is satanic in its origin, um, aims to squeeze your heart into its way of seeing things. It's narrow field of vision. Paul says, allow the Lord to help you remove those blinders as you submit to his process to remold your heart so that he can lead you to his destination of full maturity in him. You know, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Full maturity in God looks like righteousness increasing in your life and through you. Looks like righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what, that's what, uh, that, that is what an unrestricted heart looks like you know we see with our hearts so if our field of vision is determined by the world we will be squeezed into a narrow life expression so my brethren our field of vision must be expanded our field of vision must be expanded our field of vision what must be expanded in helping them expand their field of vision, Paul postulated to the Corinthians what must be a new normal for them. You know, the world is talking about a new normal. Be, be careful about um, receiving your definition of a new normal for the, from the world because it's going to restrict you. It's going to constrict you and it's going to blind you. There is a new normal that Paul advocated to the Corinthians. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, and this must be our new normal. 
He says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The things which are seen are temporary. The things that are not seen are eternal. As for we, we as for us, we look at the things that are not seen. You know, in my Bible, in this section of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, um, from verses 16 to 18, it's been, it's been moved into a different, almost like a different paragraph that has a subtitle, and the title is, Seeing the Invisible. Seeing the Invisible. You know, verse 16 begins with the phrase, Therefore, we don't lose heart. <laughs> That's a great statement to make in these times. You know, these times are not new. They might be new for us, but they are not new. Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Now, now whenever you see therefore, uh, like Brother Hagin used to say, find out what it's there for. Because they, the, 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 it means that um, a foundation has been set prior to the statement that, that validates the therefore. So why, why is it saying they don't lose heart? Um, in a few verses before this, in, in verse 13, you know, Paul says that since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore we speak. N now, verse 18 that we read explains why they had the spirit of faith. Uh, in other words, Paul was saying, because we have faith, um, we are bold, we are confident, we are moving forward, uh, so we don't lose heart. But verse 18 is the reason why they had faith. You see, you can't have true faith when your field of vision is limited to what you can see, and you are trying your best to find something positive in the trends uh, that CNN and B Bloomberg are presenting, uh, something that is positive in those trends that can generate a hopeful outlook of the future. That is not faith. That is not faith. You can't have true faith when your field of vision is limited to what you can see. Paul is saying we don't lose heart because we are seen well. We are seen and engaging with a realm of substance that is not changeable. So we are full of faith. We're advancing with confidence because our sight is accurate. As a result, Paul is saying that we are experiencing the increasing government of God in our lives. We are experiencing continuous renewal. We are seeing his increasing mercies because we are seeing well. We're not focused on things that can be seen. We are focused on things that we can't see. I believe that increasing practical, productive engagement with the spiritual realm must be the new normal for the Christian that will advance in this time. I say it again, increasing practical, productive engagement with the spiritual realm must be the new normal for the Christian that will advance in this time. It is God's plan that you advance in 2020 with accurate sight. But for you to have accurate sight, your heart must be expanded. For your heart to be expanded and your vision to be expanded, you must have increasing, practical, productive engagement with the spiritual realm. You know, this should not even be deemed a new normal. In fact, it should be called mere Christianity. This is how the Lord has always meant for us to operate. However, we have allowed ourselves to be squeezed into the world's mold. We're irregular Christians, practical operational paradigm for their lives has been no different from that of a pre-believer, except that maybe they make a few extra prayers and here and there and maybe attend a lot of conferences and a lot of, they have a lot of Christian jargon but, but no more. Our, our operational paradigm, the, 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 the input that determines our outlook 
is, 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 is typically based on the realm, on a limited field of vision, the realm of sight. To advance in this time, we must lay hold of our inheritance in Christ, which can only be laid hold of through a practical, productive engagement with the spiritual realm. Look at Moses, for instance. In um, Hebrews 11, which is what is called the, the, you know, the great heroes of faith, uh, is the chapter of the heroes of faith. It says concerning Moses that by faith, in Hebrews eleven twenty seven, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He forsook Egypt. He did not fear the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. To have faith, he had to have a tangible, productive engagement with the spiritual realm, which caused him to take actions that, from a physical perspective, made no sense. But he made those actions with boldness and with confidence because he was seeing something. He was seeing a reality. Hallelujah. You know, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, uh, the Passion Translation puts it this way. It says, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, in the heavenly realm, has already been lavished upon us as a love gift from our wonderful heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. All because he sees us wrapped in Christ. This is why we celebrate him with all our hearts. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has already been lavished upon us as a love gift meaning it is not something we have to work for as you come into christ as a love gift celebration of being a citizen of heaven of being in the christ realm the father takes everything that heaven has every resource every blessing and makes it available to you in the heavenly realm every spiritual blessing is ours by right in christ but the father did not transfer those blessings to the earth realm when we got born again. He left them in the heavenly realm for us because we have access to them there. We are spiritual beings that exist in the spiritual realm because you are spiritual in body. Your spirit right now, you who lives in a body, your spirit exists in the spiritual realm. You can't touch you. You can only touch your body. So your, the spiritual realm is not away from you. The spiritual realm is here because that is where you exist. We are spiritual beings that exist in the spiritual realm. We are citizens of his kingdom of which there is only increase. We have been lavished with every spiritual blessing in, in the heavenly realm. What does all this mean with respect to seeing well? You see, it means that the definition of reality, of what we consider to be reality, must change. I'll say it again. If we're going to expand our field of vision, if we're going to advance, we must have accurate sight. Because advancement is your portion in this time. Um, but we must resist the squeezing of the world system. And the way we do this is we must begin by redefining what reality means our definition of reality must change you see the world system which i say again is satanic has blinded us by tell, by, by selling us a wrong definition of reality we have been told that reality is the physical realm is the realm you can see Reality is what you can see, feel, taste, hear, and touch. That is reality. Science, the, the world of science is about what they call reality, ob the observable universe, the way the universe works and interacts. Reality is not this physical realm. That's wrong. Reality is the physical realm plus the spiritual realm. The physical realm plus the spiritual realm. Again, Paul in 2 Corinthians 4.18 said, he said that there are things in both realms. There are things which are seen. There are things which are not seen. Both realms are real. But with one realm, you can 
interact with it only physically. That's the physical realm. But with the other realm, which is much more powerful, the much more powerful, unchangeable eternal realm, you interact with it spiritually, with the spiritual part of you, the core of your being, the part of your being that was created in the image of the eternal God himself. It is with that part that we interact with the things in the spiritual realm. So we must begin to see well by embracing an accurate definition of reality. An accurate red definition of reality. You know, even scientists tell us that matter makes up less than 5% of reality. That might come to you as a surprise. They say that the rest of it they can't see, they can't observe, they don't exactly know what it is, but they know it's there, so they call it dark matter and dark energy. It's like it's out there, but we don't know what it is. So what they're saying is that everything you have ever seen, known, and experienced, everything that scientists have ever seen or observed in their most powerful telescopes, and the things they haven't seen but know exist somewhere in the galaxies far, far, far away. They are saying it's still just less than 5% of what is out there. So everything in the world of pandemics and the VUCA universe that are giving us cause for fear or causing contraction thinking is all part of that less than 5% of reality. So the question is, how would we react if we could see well and interact with the full picture of reality? So we must redefine reality, uh, you know, not in our heads, but in our hearts. Because you can write this down and say, yes, I know. But it, uh, we must redefine reality in our hearts and start engaging with full reality because that is where our, our, the secret to our advancement lies. This applies to you if you're a stockbroker or an investment banker or a mother raising children or a, or a new business owner or you are an employee or a government uh, in the area of government. In whatever sphere you are, you are a member of the kingdom of God. And the increase of his government and peace is meant to be experienced by you in this time. We must redefine reality. When we think of reality, the bulk of reality is the spiritual realm. Because it's the, it's, it's the eternal realm where there are things there. Hallelujah. We are there. There are things there. There are things there. You know, the center of all reality. The center of all reality. And this is where we, we have to re, re, realign our hearts yeah because the center of all reality is the throne of god not just the center of our reality but the center of all reality is the throne of god so see well see well see well the center of all reality is the throne of god that is where all bearings must be taken from that is ground zero that is the starting point the base of all activity. That is where everything receives its origin. And that is where every created being will find its final destination. The throne of the ancient of days. So lift up your eyes and look at the throne. That is the center of all reality. To give you a clear picture of the throne, I'm going to read Revelation chapter 4. I want us to remap our, 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 our ground zero. Our ground zero. I want us to lift up our eyes. I want us to see. I want us to see. I want us to see well. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. I'm going to read from the Passion Translation again. It says, instantly I was taken into the spiritual realm. And behold, I saw a heavenly throne set in place and someone seated upon it. His appearance was like sparkling, was sparkling like crystal and glowing like a carnelian gemstone. Surrounding the throne was a circle of green light like an emerald rainbow. 
encircling the great throne were 24 elders, 24 thrones with elders, in glistening white garments, seated upon them, each wearing a golden crown of victory. Uh, excuse me, this is not um, excellent prose. This is not, a, this is not metaphorical language. He entered the spiritual realm and saw reality. This is reality. He says, and pulsing from the throne were blinding flashes of lightning, crashes of thunder and voices. And burning before the throne are seven blazing torches, torches which represent the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne was a pavement like a crystal sea of glass. Around the throne on each side stood, stood four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature resembled a lion, the second an ox. The third had a human face. The fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of the four living creatures had six wings full of eyes all around and under their wings. They worshipped without ceasing, day and night singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The was, the ease, and the coming. And whenever the living creatures gave glory, honor, and thanks to the one who is enthroned and who lived forever and ever, the 24 elders fell face down before the one seated on the throne. And, and, and they worshipped the one who lives forever and ever. And they, surrounded, they surrendered their crowns before the throne singing, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, power, for you created all things. And by your plan, they were created and exist. So lift up your eyes and look. That is your father. When you call to God, that is where you are calling to for help. That is where your wisdom comes from. Every blessing in that realm that you have just seen is yours. Every resource in that realm is yours. That is where your protection comes from. Oh, what are you seeing when you call to God for protection? What are you seeing when you say, Father, I plead the blood of Jesus. When you declare that to the angels of God that ex ex excel in strength and do his bidding and hearken to the voice of his word. When you declare that I'm a child of God and the angels keep me in all my ways. What are you seeing? I can tell you what David saw when he cried out to God. You know, in, in, uh, in Psalm, Psalm 18, look at the reality of David's expression. Look at Psalm 18. I'm going to read um, from verse... I'm going to read from verse 11. Let me, no, let me start reading from verse 6. I'm having a lot of fun here. David said, I cried out to you in my distress, the delivering God. And from your temple throne, you heard my troubled cry. My sobs came right into your heart. You see, your cries, uh, God is not impervious. The, the Bible may, may say that he's, you know, uh, he, he, we don't have a high priest that is not touched with the feeling of infirmities. He's saying that because it's, it's real. It's real. It's real. He says, my sobs come right into your heart. And you turned your face to rescue me. The earth itself shivered and shook. It reeled and rocked before him. As the mountains trembled, they melted away. For his anger was kindled, burning on my behalf. Fierce flames left from his mouth. Erupting with blazing, burning coals, as smoke and fire encircled him. He stretched heaven's curtain open. He came to my defense. Swiftly, he rode to the earth as the stormy sky was lowered. He rode on a chariot of thunder clouds and mystic darkness. A cherub his steed as he swooped down, soaring on the wings of spirit wind. Wrapped and hidden in the thick cloud darkness. His thunder tabernacle surrounded him. He hid himself in mystery darkness. The dense rain clouds were his garment. Suddenly, the brilliance of his presence broke through with lightning bolts and with a mighty storm from heaven, like a tempest drooping or dropping coals of fire. The Lord thundered a great, the great God above every God spoke his thunder voice from the skies with fearsome hailstones and flashes of fire were before him. He released his lightning arrows. And routed my foes. 
See how they ran and scattered in fear. Then with his mighty roar, he laid bare the foundations of the earth, uncovering the secret source of the sea. The hidden depths of land and sea were exposed by the hurricane blast of his hot breath. He reached down from heaven, all the way down from the sky to the sea. He reached down into my darkness to rescue me. <laughs> he reached down. I mean, can you imagine? This is what God does. When we call on heaven, this is how heaven responds. You know, the, the, uh, you know, it's a common phrase among the seals that you don't, you don't leave a, a, a seal behind. How much more your heavenly father. Hallelujah. How much more your heavenly father. No one, no one, no one is left behind. You know, this is not poetry. This is how the kingdom responds. Because God is no respecter of persons. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, the reality of the kingdom, we must see well. We must see well. We must take our reference point from the throne. You know, look, look again at um, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 12. Let's look at Hebrews 12, verse 22. As I bring this part to a close this morning. Oh, we must take our reference point from the throne. It must be a, a reality that burns in our hearts. Hebrews 12, verse 22 says, By contrast, we have already come near to God in a totally different realm, the Zion realm. For we have we've entered the city of the living God, which is the new Jerusalem in heaven. We have joined the festal gathering of myriads of angels in their joyous celebration. And as members of the church of the firstborn, all our names have been legally registered. As citizens of heaven and we have come before God who judges all and who lives among the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect in his sight and we have come to Jesus who established a new covenant with his blood sprinkled upon the mercy seat blood that continually speaks from heaven forgiveness a better message than Abel's blood that cries from the earth justice you know, when we read this, is this what our heart has embraced? As we look at this in faith, we must allow the Lord to remold our minds, to remove the restrictions, to help us see that the field, um, the field is wider than what you can see physically. The field includes, and at its center is the throne of God. It includes... Uh, um, all the, the saints that have gone before. It includes everything that heaven has. It includes an innumerable company of angels. It includes a heavenly or holy of holies where the blood of the Lord Jesus is speaking on your behalf. So see well. See well. See and be free. See and receive strength to conceive. See and receive hope. See and receive courage. See and receive joy. This is our new normal. Look at what um, Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 to 4 says. The Passion Translation. It says Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. This is why we are to yearn for all that is above. For that's where Christ sits enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Yes, feast. Oh, come and say with me. Feast. Feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm. Oh, come on. If you're going to have a feast, it means that you are going to overeat on something. You are going to overindulge on something. You are going to be intoxicated by something. When Paul was speaking to the Ephesians, he says, don't be intoxicated with wine. The Ephesian church was a mature church. He wasn't talking, they didn't have a problem with drinking. He was saying that don't be intoxicated with the wine of the world system. There is something that you can be intoxicated with. Be intoxicated with the treasures of heaven. That is where we should spend a majority of our concentration, of our focus. 
That is where we should receive our direction. That's where we should receive our information. We're not saying don't watch CNN, but receive more from Heaven's Network than you get from CNN. Let, if you are feasting on Heaven's Network, if you are feasting on the report of the Lord, if you are feasting on what Heaven says you have, you are not going to be molded into the world's way of seeing things. Restrictions will be removed from your heart. Your sight will be broadened because you are seen in the midst of calamity on the earth. You are seen an innumerable company of angels that are walking with you. You are seeing the grace and the power of God available on your behalf. But I won't finish this, the, the passage. It says, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions. Oh, come on. It says, not with the distractions. You are going to get information from the earthly realm that's going to distract you. And that is why you need to have feasted on something that is substantive. Your crucifixion with Christ has severed you, severed the tie to this life. And now your true life is hidden away in God in Christ. And as Christ himself is seen for who he really is. Who you really are. Who you really are will also be revealed, for you are now one with him in his glory. You know what the Bible is telling us is that we do not know who we really are. We do not know who we really are. The revelation of who you really are is not going to happen when Christ comes. The revelation, or not, is you don't have to wait for when Christ comes. Christ can come in your life right now. If you feast on the reality of the heavenly realm, the reality of who you really are will dawn on you. I remember a testimony that was given by Brother Copeland years ago. He said the Lord spoke to him about a lady who was somewhere in Israel. And he said, Ken, I'd like you to take your plane and I'd like you to go minister to that lady. Because on planet Earth today, the only person that this woman will listen to is you. So fuel your jet, go to, I think it was in Israel, and go minister to her and come back home. And he was in prayer and he was like, you know, struggling with the Lord. And he said, Lord... Do you know how much fuel it would take to go to Israel? Do you want me? It, it, is, it doesn't seem to be prudent, um, you know, management of the resources that you have given me in this ministry. Is there no other person that can go and speak to this woman? And the Lord said to Kenneth, he said, uh, Kenneth, if any of your sons was in trouble, is there anything you will not do for them? Is there anything? He said, that is my daughter. Oh, I'm feeling the compassion of the Spirit right now. He said, that is my daughter. There is nothing I will not give. There is no resource I will not expend on the behalf of my daughter. You and I must feast on the realities of, of the Father's love. We must feast on the realities of heaven because only then will we come into a true understanding of who we are. The picture we see in, in, in Psalm 18 is a picture of reality, what God will do for anyone in his kingdom. So I prophesy to you from now on, you will see an open heaven and you will see yourself permanently seated in Christ at the right hand of the Father. It is from Him that you will see the affairs of your life. It is through Him that you will frame your life in the earth. I want us to do this song together. I'm going to have the words shown just below. It's a very simple song that's taken from Revelation 4 that we just read. It's one of the songs that's going to be published by High Life in the days ahead. To him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb, be blessed in glory, honor, power, and might. 
To him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. We magnify your name forevermore. Come on to him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Be blessed in glory, on a power and mind. Look with me. To him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. We magnify your name forevermore. Oh, one more time to him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Be glory, honor, power, and might to him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. We magnify your name forevermore. We magnify your name forevermore. Oh, we magnify your name forevermore. Let us see well. Let us see well. And let us walk like the sons of God in this time. It is a year of your advancement as you have accurate sight. Thank you for tuning in to our High Life broadcast. Um, It is important to remember that the person that is blessed is not the one that hears the word. But is the person that does the word. Take the word and feast on it. Feast on it. Feast on it. it. Let it remap your paradigm. Let it recenter you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at true reality. Um, Before I pray for you, I'm going to, after after I pray, we're going to play a um, uh, a poem that was written by uh, my dear friend, uh, Pastor Femi Gubanwo, and it's been recited by my daughter, Zoella. Um, And and it really, uh, I love this poem because it also shows us what our reality is. This is our new normal, people. This is our new normal. We must embrace this as the new normal. Hallelujah. As a new normal. The reality of God. The reality of us in His presence. The reality of all His resources. The reality of engaging with the spiritual realm. Next week, I am going to then uh, begin to talk about the river. Um, because as our, as our vision expands, then uh, the resources that we have access to... Um, uh, our field of vision about those resources will expand as well. And that's what I'm going to be uh, talking about next week. So God bless you. Have yourself a wonderful week. Make it a productive week, uh, a, a week of engagement with the realm of the Spirit, with your, fa- with your Father and the resources of heaven. God bless you and see you next Sunday. My world is a world of incredibles of truth that defies logic, of fantasies truer than experience, a world of the future that shapes the past and makes the present but a dream, where molten dragons hang by their tails off golden trees in embryonic sacks of ice until they're ripe to fly, where apples and peaches and grapes and figs give birth at the crescendo of boundary song of wind and leaves and branches where Balrogs are withstood with a powerful Thou shalt not pass, but the Red Sea could not withstand a divine Thou shalt part. Where serpent whispers poison that render, and the other fruit only gives death. Where citrus gives its life in a stream of aromatic elixir, to all who cross its shadows with a thirsty thought. Where spring showers are merely dripping dew in the heavenly fauna, seeping deep into the veins of ecstatic vision, where the sun stood still in divine carnage and later hurried to catch up with time, where dimensions are layered, laced with hex portals that yield to the initiated, 
Where lost metal tools float at the wooing of a prophet's stick, and invisible armies win battles for the chosen ones. Where the rivers flow with wine and the streams with strong drink, and where strength is renewed by soaking in a river of pregnant words. Where an ass might see an angel and banter with a greed blinded prophet, and another prophet's bear brings divine judgment on lawless youth. Where giants are slain by a lad touched by destiny, and ignoble become brave hearts and champions. Of staffs turning into snakes, snakes swallowing snakes, snakes turning into rods and irresistible demands for freedom. Of dead men living again just because he said so. And those made alive vying to die just because they will be raised from the dead. Where the dead are only raised to die again, only to be raised to dead again, now dead to death where all things share a common source, and that source is the end of all things. Thank you. We are ahead of the curve, devoted to Christ, a voice for the voiceless, accurate in preferring solutions to difficult problems. We are non-conformists, defining culture, compassionate towards humanity and the earth. We are also extraordinary high flyers who are reframing the world we live in. High life, we advance.